So just four weeks ago, the Jaguars were sitting in a pretty opportunistic position. They were 4-4 four and four, heading into the game against London with three straight divisional games coming up. A real opportunity to get a jump on the AFC South and really get themselves into the playoff pitcher. The Jaguars used that opportunity to and completely threw it down the toilet. It's been a horrible three games in a row. The Jaguars not only lost all three of those games heading to a record of 4-7, and seven, but they lost them all in completely blowout fashion, each game getting more embarrassing than the next. They lost each game by 20 points. They allowed over 200 yards rushing in each of those games. They had four 100 yards rushers, and they had a quarterback switch from Minshew Mania over to Nick Foles, and that hasn't gone very well. So the Jaguars right now, like I said, they sit 4-7, and seven and our season is over. Our season is over. I mean, there's going to be very optimistic fans that will tell you that, look, the season isn't over. They could still win this, this. Guys, I'm going to be real with you guys. The Jaguars aren't winning those games. The Jaguars, the Jaguars just aren't. Just keeping it real. So really, my position right now, I'm pretty much in off-season mode right now. I am done with this season. I'll still be putting out preview videos. I'll still be doing game recaps, but... You know, with the way that the roster sits and with the way the coaching staff is and the culture, I am ready to throw the 2019 season down in the books. And in my last video, I kind of said that I don't know where the Jaguars go from here. I don't know what to do from here. It's going to take a lot of work. And I really thought about what I said there and said, you know what, maybe I will discuss what I will do. And in this video, I am going to discuss what I would do from the day after our final game of the season against the Colts all the way up until the 2020 NFL Draft. From, you know, who we're going to let go to who we should potentially, uh, you know, what we should do in the draft and all that business. So with that said, let's get it. Now the person that is going to be making all of these decisions is going to be our owner, Shad Khan. And to go over Shad Khan a little bit since he took over as owner, uh, Shad Khan officially bought the team on January 4th of 2012. And the team has not been very good under Shad Khan. To go over his records, 2012 we finished with a record of 2-14. 2013, 4-12. 2014, 3 and 13. 2015, 5 and 11. 2016, 3 and 13. 2017, 10 and 6. 2018, 5 and 11. And 2019, 4 and 7 so far. Uh, that leads us to him to an overall record of 36 and 87, uh, which is an average of 5 and 11 each season. So with that said, Shad Khan's second best year has been 5-11. That's been his second best year as an owner. And we randomly had an AFC Championship game appearance within all those games. Very weird to think about that, given an AFC Championship appearance was shoved between all double-digit lost seasons. But whatever, I still love that year, and I'll always appreciate that. Now, you know, Shad Khan, I really do think he's growing impatient. I mean, he has to be growing impatient with all the money that he spent, with all the time he's given to different uh, different coaches, GMs, whatever. He's got to be growing impatient. And um, really, if I were Shad Khan, I would completely clean house. I would get rid of Tom Coughlin, Dave Caldwell, Doug Marone, all of them. Now, when you look at some of the, the stuff that Shad Khan has done when it comes to front office coaching-wise... In 2012, he stuck with Gene Smith, and he brought on Mike Mularkey as a head coach. And Mike Mularkey was a one-and-done for the Jaguars. And Gene Smith, he only hung on for one year. And then in 2013, he did completely clean house. And then he hired Dave Caldwell as a GM and also Gus Bradley as a head coach. And, you know, Gus Bradley was a guy who lasted three full seasons and then being fired with, I think, two games left in 2016 so you know he gave all those guys a pretty decent amount of time and in 2015 was when Doug Marone was actually brought in as an offensive line coach 
And then 2017, Doug Marone was promoted to a full-time head coach with Tom Coughlin coming in as executive vice president of football operations for the team. So you look at it and, you know, Dave Caldwell has been here since 2013. Doug Marone has been here since 2015. And Tom Coughlin has been here since 2017. Now, I will go ahead and start with Doug Marone. Now, Doug Marone, I appreciate so much from what he did in 2017. I mean... Leading us that 2017 season, it was the first year I did my YouTube channel. It was so much fun. Like, it was by far the most fun year I've ever had under any team, really. I mean, I was a fan of the Florida Gators back when they had a national championship run. I was, you know, a UCF alumni when uh, we went undefeated. And I've been fans of other teams, you know, whatever, White Sox, Magic, whatever have you. Um, that year was awesome. I mean, we were we were legitimately playing meaningful games in December. We The Seahawks game is one I will never forget. I was at the Buffalo Bills wild card game in TIAA Bank Field. Awesome environment. And then just watching us beat the Steelers in the fashion we did was epic. Like, it was awesome. But... Hasn't been the same since then. You know, Doug Marone in 2018, the team was bad. We were, I think, 5-11 and 11 is what we finished. Now, you know, Doug Marone had the excuses of, you know, the whole entire, basically our whole offense was getting injured. Quarterback play was bad. It was definitely filled with excuses. But 2019, there really isn't much excuse-wise. Uh, now, of course, like, he was given a raw deal when it comes to Nick Foles getting injured week one. And I think he did a really good job of... Uh, handling the whole Jalen Ramsey thing. I mean, he was the fall guy for Tom Coughlin and Dave Caldwell. Tom Coughlin and Dave Caldwell still haven't spoken to media since the Jalen Ramsey deal went down. I mean, the biggest trade in franchise history went down when we traded Jalen Ramsey for two first-round picks. But, you know, those guys were Tom Coughlin and Dave Caldwell were nowhere to be found. Um, so he was having to answer the questions on that when he really had nothing to do with the trade. Really where I fell off the Doug Marone bandwagon was... Just the last three games against, you know, against the Texans, Colts, and Titans where we, where we were completely outcoached, completely outschemed. The team, it, it was just, it was one of the worst three-game stretches I've seen in team history. And, you know, this was a team that was 4-4 four and four going into it, and we just completely blew those games. So... That was when I kind of fell off the Doug Rome bandwagon, and, you know, he's been given his opportunities. I just think that... I. I just think that at the end of the day, he might just be an average coach. Um, and I think it's kind of time to move on from Doug Marone. Next is Dave Caldwell. Dave Caldwell has been given a lot of opportunities. You know, if we look through his most recent drafts, really his first draft in 2013, only Jonathan Cyprian is still in the NFL from that year. I mean, we drafted, you know, Luke Jokel number two overall. Uh, we drafted guys like Ace Sanders, Dwayne Grotz was not a good draft at all. Um, 2014, it was actually a pretty decent draft, but the only guys that were actually signed after that in free agency once the contracts expired were Marquise Lee, Blake Bortles, Telvin Smith, and Brandon Linder. 2015, the only guy left from that draft is AJ Can. Uh, 2016, the only guys left from that draft are Miles Jack, who we did re-sign, and Yannick Ngakwe, who is still pending a you know for, uh, an extension. So we've got to be able to get that done. I don't think it will get done during the season just because I don't know if Shad Khan will, you know, I think ultimately Shad Khan is going to let the next GM decide on what he wants to do with him. But I would ultimately hope, and God, if we don't re-sign Yannick Ngakwe, I will be extremely pissed off. I'll just say that right now. And, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, those are all still left up for debate. You know, you've got guys like Leonard Fournette, Cam Robinson, D.D. Westbrook, DeJuan Smoot from the 2017 NFL Draft. You know, 2018, Taven Bryan, um, DJ Chark, whatever. You know, those are still, we'll still let those kind of things play out. But the drafts have been pretty unimpressive. And what might be more unimpressive than those drafts has been some of the money that we spent in free agency and some of the guys that we've signed. You know, first I'll go ahead and discuss some of the guys that were decent. You know, guys that I'm not going to give, you know, really high grades on, but I'm not, also not going to shit on. You know, some of those were like Jeremy Parnell, who was able to stay at right tackle for some time, and he got a good good amount of playing time. 
Um, you also had Prince of Mukamara on a one-year deal. Kelvin Beecham, who came in for one year. Uh, Barry Church, who was a part of that really good Jaguars defense in 2017. But, you know, he was cut midseason in 2018, and he hasn't uh, been on a roster since. Um, and also Austin Safarian Jenkins, who I thought was going to have a big impact, but he got hurt like two or three games into the 2018 season. Now, some of the good. I'll go ahead and say some of the good. Malik Jackson was good. You know, he was... Uh, very productive for us. Uh, Tashawn Gibson was also a good free agent signing. Calais Campbell, A.J. Boye, D.J. Hayden, Chris Conley I think is pretty good. So those are some of the good. Now, let's get to some of the bad. Some of the bad were Toby Gerhardt, Zane Beatles, Julius Thomas, Jared Audrick, Sergio Brown, Devon House, Chris Ivory, Dante Moncrief, Marquise Lee, Doubling down on Blake Bortles, Andrew Norwell, and must I say Nick Foles. Oh my gosh, that is a lot of wasted money. That is a lot of money that, you know, Shad Khan let him spend. We've been big time free agency spenders, especially from 2015 to 2017. We had some good, you know, we had a couple all pros. You know, Clay's Campbell showed out in 2017 and 2018. Um, you know, A.J. Boye had a Pro Bowl season, but... Man, other than that, we have wasted a bunch of a bunch of guys. And at the end of the day, we, we need to get rid of Dave Caldwell, I believe. You know, we need to get a guy to come in here and really view the roster from an objective standpoint that has no draft bias recency or free agent bias recency and really get a guy to come in and look at this team from an objective standpoint and figure out what to do with it. And really, the ultimate things that kind of that were the downfall of Dave Caldwell as a Jaguars GM uh, were some of the first round busts. I mean, you know, you look at like Luke Jokel, he wasn't very good. Blake Bortles, you doubled down on Blake Bortles, he didn't turn out to be very good. Dante Feller, uh, I mean, he's showing out for the Los Angeles Rams, and you know, us getting Yannick Ngakwe really, you know, put that draft, you know, put that made him a backup. Yannick Ngakwe forced him into being a backup and obviously he had some, you know, troubles in Jacksonville when it comes to, you know, obviously he lost his rookie year, but also some disciplinary stuff. He wasn't the most disciplined guy out ever, so you know, you kinda have that. Uh, you know, some other guys like Taven Bryan getting him over Lamar Jackson, you know, I'll get into that later, but you know, that was one thing. Obviously the free agent bust which I which I mentioned recently recently and just the quarterback misplays, man. Like, he missed on a lot of quarterbacks. A lot of quarterbacks. I mean, you drafted Blake Bortles in 2014 NFL draft. Um, so, whatever, you drafted number three overall. There were other guys out there like Johnny Manziel, Teddy Bridgewater, Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr. You know, a lot of those guys um, turn into pretty good players. So... You misplayed that draft and just, um, you know, and after 2016, like 2016 was a horrible year for Blake Bortles and you went ahead and you skipped down on a couple quarterbacks in the 2017 NFL draft. I mean, the Bears basically set a pick for us and took Trubisky at number two. So that left Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes on the board for us at that spot. And a lot of people are going to say, oh, you know, you would have never thought that Patrick Mahomes would have turned into what he was. You know, or like, you know, people say about a Patrick Mahomes. Look, guys, it's not my job and it's not your job watching this video to be able to scout a guy like Patrick Mahomes. There is Dave Caldwell and guys like that being paid millions of dollars in the front office to find these quarterbacks that weren't able to find him. You know, you had good organizations like the Texans and like the Chiefs who both traded up to get these guys and you know they are reaping the benefits of it you know what i'm saying so that happened in 2017 and then 2018 happened where you doubled down on Blake Bortles and you know at number 29 overall you draft Taven Bryan over Lamar Jackson now you know a lot of GMs missed on on Lamar Jackson because i believe he was like the number 31 or 32 overall pick in that draft and hell even the Ravens missed on him the Ravens drafted Hayden Hurst before Lamar Jackson so a lot of people didn't know what he was going to become but 
you know, that's on all those GMs for missing on that guy. And then, you know, you look at Lamar Jackson now, and he's doing a lot of great, great things. And now, granted, I don't think Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes, or Lamar Jackson will be doing as good on the Jacksonville Jaguars as they are on their respective teams, just because all those teams have winning cultures. They have really good organizations. You know, a lot of those teams are cons- are consistently in the playoffs. And the Jaguars don't have that. So, you know, Lamar Jackson, I don't know for a fact, wouldn't be doing this good on the Jaguars. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes wouldn't either. And most likely, Deshaun Watson too. But you missed on all those guys. And then 2019 comes, and then we pay Nick Foles a career backup, you know, all that money. You know, like $88 million. And, you know, that's not looking so good so far. He's looking like backup Nick Foles. He's looking like Chiefs. Rams Nick Foles as opposed to you know postseason Nick Foles and you know I'm you know I'm one of those actually I'll get into this later but you know the most valuable thing that really and like Gardner Minshew has been the best thing that Dave Caldwell has done at quarterback and that probably wasn't even Dave Caldwell with that pick it was most likely a Pacific Northwest scout that was the guy that said okay let's throw this six round flyer at Gardner Minshew because you know I'm a guy that thinks that you should be drafting quarterbacks in every draft in the later rounds throw fifth sixth seventh round picks at them you know it can it can work out you know we got Brandon Allen a few years ago who had a few starts with Denver Broncos this year so that didn't really work out for the Jaguars because we did cut him Tanner Lee definitely didn't work out but you know Gardner Minshew it seems like you may have struck gold with him Gardner Minshew was four and four as a starter for the Jaguars Minshew mania was so much fun you know, for the Jaguars, you know, while he was out there doing his thing. So, I mean, you look at all the things that Dave Caldwell has done at quarterback, he gets he gets a big F at quarterback because, you know, his quarterback evaluations have been horrible, horrible. And I know I was the guy that defended Blake Bortles, but like I said, it's not my job to go out here and be great in quarterbacks. You know, I, I'm a full-time accountant. I'm not you know, a scout. I'm not a GM. I don't get paid a bunch of money. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And then the final nail on the coffin, or coffin, sorry, bad pun, but we need to get rid of Tom Coughlin. Tom Coughlin was brought in to change the culture. It seemed like he did wonders in 2017, but at the end of the day, the culture right now sucks. The culture right now Players don't want to play for the Jaguars. You know, Jalen Ramsey made it quite clear he didn't want to play for the Jaguars. You also, you know, Telvin Smith, a lot of rumors are saying that, you know, he's not here right now because he doesn't, he didn't like Tom Coughlin. And now you also have to, you know, realize that the timing of his sitting one year out literally came within a week after Tom Coughlin called him out to the media. You know what I'm saying? So pretty convenient timing. You know, we've had Al Robinson liking tweets, you know, liking anti-Tom Coughlin tweets. And at the end of the day, we need to bring in a culture that will fit the millennials. Like, I mean, most of the NFL is full of millennials. You have a bunch of 20-year-olds. You know, the best players in the NFL are all in their 20s. So, you know, you got to bring in a fun atmosphere that, you know, maybe not super lackluster, but one that, you know can cater to to players, one that players want to come into work. I mean, even Aaron Coleman, you know, basically said that, you know, after he signed his deal over to Texans, he said that, you know, Tom Coughlin in the Jaguars organization, it was like walking on eggshells. And that culture might work for a year. You know, it might work for that. But if you want to have a sustainable, good team with a good culture, I mean, you're going to have to have a friendly culture. I mean, you can't just have players constantly coming into work, not wanting to come into work, and, you know, being afraid to kind of come in and be themselves. You know, we can't have that. And, you know, the whole Jalen Ramsey thing, I think the Jalen Ramsey thing is going to work out for us is because we have a lot of holes in our roster and we're not. If we had Jalen Ramsey, that wasn't going to be the difference in us being a good team. I mean, it's proven in the past. It's not going to be that. And we got a good amount of draft capital for him. And we don't have to pay him a lot of money in free agency as you know his deal was going to be coming up soon so but we had to take what he said as a warning and really get Tom Coughlin out of there to bring in a new you know culture so yeah completely clean house get some new guys in there and 
you know, bring in a GM, you know, bring in the way the typical organization works, bring in a GM, let him hire the head coach, you know, maybe have some consultants in there to, you know, determine what head coach you want to hire. You know, I will, I will go over my head coaching candidates in another video. Um, but that's just my thoughts so far, you know, cause there's, I have a, I have a pretty good long list of, you know, head coaches I would consider. So definitely be on the lookout for that video. So one big theme that the Jaguars are going to have to decide what to do on is the quarterback situation. You know, obviously we pay Nick Foles a lot of money, $88 million. And unless we trade him, he's going to be on the roster in ne like next season because he has a $33 million cap hit. And you really wonder, you know, who has a higher ceiling, Nick Foles or Gardner Minshew? It's tough to tell. And I think I th I'm definitely on a Minshew bandwagon. I would rather start week one next year with Gardner Minshew. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be saying, oh, uh, but you you said that you wanted to bench Gardner Minshew for Nick Foles. Yeah, I did say that. And I still do think that we should be playing Nick Foles for the time being. You know, I thought that we were at it. We were at a point in the season where, you know, it seemed like we were, we needed a spark, you know, when we were sitting there at, uh, four and five. I thought we needed a spark, and I thought, you know, I thought Nick Foles deserved a chance, and I still do think that uh, he deserves a chance to play and kind of show what he's worth. I mean, he's came in and like kind of done all the right things and said all the Gus Bradley quotes you can have to the media, whatever. Um, I, I think he does deserve the chance to start, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, I would like to still see Gardner Minshew play at least two games at the end of the season. And um, really, with Nick Foles, I mean, I, I don't want to be paying a quarterback that much to be sitting on the bench. And this may be premature to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it. We would have to try to try to find a trade partner for Nick Foles. And I don't think that, you know, a lot of people are going to be saying, oh, we should be able to get a third-round pick for him. We should be able to get a fourth-round pick for him. I don't think that's the case. When I think of the Nick Foles situation, I think back to Brock Osweiler in 2017. In 2016, the Houston Texans signed Brock Osweiler to a four-year, $72 million deal. And Brock Osweiler in 2017, no, in 2016, was a complete failure of a free agent signing. He was a cancer in a locker room. He didn't elevate the team at all, and he just wasn't very good. In 2017, the cap hit was so much where they couldn't just straight up release him. They traded him to the Browns with a second round pick. They gave away Brock Osweiler and a second round pick, and I think got like a seventh round pick in return. Like they gave away draft capital to take him off of their books. The Jaguars might have to do the same. The Nick Foles contract is pretty disgusting. You know what I'm saying? They might they might have to actually give away like a fourth round pick, you know, maybe to the Miami Dolphins. You know, the Dolphins are trying to get all the draft capital that they can. Hell, they even, you know, the Rams literally traded them a key to leave and a fifth round pick in exchange for a seventh round pick for them to take on that contract. You know, hopefully Miami might be still purging draft picks in the offseason and we might have to send them over there. You know what I'm saying? And if we get rid of Nick Foles, it really opens up, you know, what we can do in free agency. And I'm not one that wants to be a big free agency spender. Hell, look at what I just mentioned with all the free agent busts that we had. You know what I'm saying? I don't think we should spend a lot of money in free agency. Got to build through the draft. But, you know, we've got to re-sign Yannick Ngagwe. That's for damn sure. And we've got to fill some holes in other places, you know, which I'll go over later. But, you know, with Nick Foles, guys, like, I'm on a Garner Minshew train. I really am. I would rather move forward with him. I think he, you know, gives us a higher ceiling and and like the next GM is going to have to make a decision on this. Like we know if Tom Coughlin or Dave Caldwell stay in here, you know, they're not going to want to do anything with him just because they want to look smart and keep him and hope he plays well. But, you know, I'm all for, you know, keeping Garner Minshew. Garner Minshew shows a lot of good things. He shows that he's a very smart quarterback. He shows that he's highly accurate. And we can only hope that he can develop into like a Drew Brees. You know what I'm saying? Because Drew Brees is undersized. He came in with not great arm strength. But uh, Drew Brees has a really good feel for the pocket. He's very accurate and he's very smart. 
that's who I hope that Garner Minshew, you know, maybe a poor man's Drew Brees, but, you know, Nick Foles just isn't very fun. He really isn't. And, um, you know, I think he signed with the team. You know, I think Doug Peterson is a complete offensive mastermind, and I give him a lot of credit for being able to, you know, build an offensive scheme around him to form his strength. So that's what I would do at a quarterback situation. So, yeah, let me know what you guys would do. Um, so some of the guys, uh, once free aid, or I guess once pre-free agency comes, we're going to have to cut some players, obviously. Every year you cut players, you know, to make some move to make some, you know, more, to get more cap for you. And some of the things that I would do, you know, some guy, like two guys that I would cut that I would hope we can maybe restructure with, but with their current deals, it, it, it just makes more sense to cut, which would be Marcel Darius. We would save $20 million by cutting him and Calais Campbell. We would save $15 million by cutting Calais Campbell. And um, it's tough. I would hope that we can maybe restructure these contracts, especially with Marcel Darius, because, Cutting him would leave a huge hole at the interior of the off at the defensive line. So and he still is performing at a pretty good level. And also Calais Campbell, I mean his play as the season has gone on, it's dropped off a lot. He's looking like he's getting a lot older. But part of that might be just him playing through injuries. But this is a couple years in a row where he is battling through injuries. So I would hope that we can restructure that deal and bring him back. So yeah, and a couple of guys that will just outright cut that I am not interested in bringing back. Andrew Norwell, we'd be saving $5.5 million with him. He's still the highest paid guard in the NFL. What a horrible signing he's been. And also cut Marquise Lee, that would save us $5.2 million. So those are the four main guys that I would cut. I mean, there might be some small cuts, you know, Besides that, but those are the only like really significant cuts that you would actually be saving money on that I would do. You know, some guys I would keep would be AJ Boye. I would keep Brandon Leonard just because you had to keep some guys on the interior. So yeah, and really with the free agency, I would re-sign Yannick Ngakwe. That would really be the only big money I would want to go out and splash in free agency, and you know get some get some cheaper guys to fill in, kind of like this year how we go out and grab uh, Chris Conley on a cheap deal. Um, you kind of brought in Jared Wilson on a cheap deal. You know, just fill some spots with that and then go forward with that. Now, when it comes to the draft, the Jaguars have a lot of holes right now. You know, when you look at it, offensive line, especially on the interior, we need to improve in there. Uh, defensive tackle, we're going to have a huge hole there. I think we need a wide receiver too. I think Char can be our wide receiver one and... I think D.D. Westbrook is looking more like a wide receiver two. I think if we can get, or a wide receiver three, and I think if we can get a true wide receiver two, a guy like Calvin Ridley or something like that, a very speedy wide receiver that is a really good route runner that can get really good separation, you know, I think that would be really valuable to our team. Um, I think that we need to move Miles Jack to weak side linebacker and get a true middle linebacker. I don't think that middle linebacker would come in, in a draft just because it's a lot to bring in a rookie and really expect him to be the quarterback of the defense and align everybody right. You know, I think I think we need to get a guy in free agency. Maybe Jake Ryan, if that if Jake Ryan is a real person, uh, because right now I don't think he's a real person. Everyone talks about him, but I haven't seen him yet. You know, maybe he can. You know, he has a lot of experience, so maybe he can play that middle linebacker spot. But you know, Miles Jack, we just extended him. He's, we're paying a lot of money to him, so uh, we're. I think that it's too much thinking for him at the middle linebacker spot. I think he would be a really good fit at middle at weak side linebacker because we've all seen him uh, play at a high level. Like he is, I think we need to put him in a position where he can just track down the ball. Uh, you know where he's playing, you know closer to the line of scrimmage or whatever, and just have him be in a position where he can just mostly be a ball hawk and you know, chase guys around, and, you know, I think that he would be the best in uh, that weak side linebacker spot, and we obviously need tight ends, you know, we drafted Josh Oliver at pick, at the 69 overall spot in the third round of the 2019 NFL draft, it was a complete wasted year with him, he spent half the season on the IR, you know, he came back and played like three games, and he got put back on the IR, he missed all of training camp, all of the preseason, you know, with his injury. He was a small, he, he played at San Jose State, so his college experience wasn't that great. It was a lost year for him this year. You know what I'm saying? So 
Uh, I'm not comfortable with saying, okay, we were good at the tight end position with him. We can move forward. We still need to upgrade with that spot. Now, we could, we could get a free safety also to upgrade from Jared Wilson. But other than that, like I said, we got a lot of holes. So really, in a draft, we need to just go best available player every single round. You know, I'm not going to try to pigeonhole us into saying, oh, you know, we really need to get, uh, you know, an offensive line. So we're going to pass up on this really good defensive tackle. You know, good teams build. Good, you know, good teams build through the draft, and good teams keep getting best available player in the draft because you can get yourself in a lot of trouble if you're reaching for need. And the Jaguars have so many needs right now that that's what we need to be doing. So yeah, those are some of the ways that I would fix. Actually, let me mention cornerback. You know, I don't think cornerback is a huge need. I think A.J. Boye is still a good cornerback. D.J. Hayden is really good in the slot. And Trey Hernan is actually playing pretty damn well, I think. Um, you know, he may not be super flashy, but, you know, he's actually playing pretty well. So, you know, I guess when we have all these different needs, I guess cornerback, I guess we could always use cornerback depth, but that would be, you know, that's just one little note from me. So those are some things that I would do and I do want to touch on the whole Tom Coughlin thing another big reason why we need to get rid of Tom Coughlin is because if we keep Tom Coughlin then all of a sudden the GM and head coaching job become really unattractive if you have a micromanager in Tom Coughlin in there you know deciding what you need to do you know like it, it just it would become very unattractive no one wants to report to Tom Coughlin I hear he's not a very fun guy to work with. So we need to get him out of there. And really, the GM spot all of a sudden becomes a one of the most attractive positions, if not the most attractive GM opening in the NFL because you're going to have four first-round picks in the next two years. You're going to have a lot of reins over the roster, and you're going to be able to pick out your head coach. So, yeah. That's what I got to say there. So... With that said, this is a very heavy video. I really appreciate all you guys for watching it. Um, those are some of the things that I would do. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section, guys. And you know, also, if you guys enjoy my Jaguars coverage, um, you know, I've got merch available down in the links down below. So definitely purchase, you know, a shirt for twenty-five dollars if you want to support the channel and if you enjoy my Jags coverage. I think I have really unique Jaguars coverage, uh, unique to any other outlet out there. So. You know, hopefully you guys all enjoy it too. And if you guys can, drop a like on the video if you guys enjoyed it. And I appreciate you guys watching this video. I know it was a very long video, a very in-depth video. But I really wanted to dig into this team and really tell you guys what I would do if I were Shad Khan running the show. So thank you guys for watching. And do ball till I die. As always, go Jaguars.